Um, so I'm, I'm our snake, um, and uh, I work for a company called Sec Theory out of Austin, Texas. I run hackers and slackers, and uh, this is Jabra. How's it going, DEF CON? Ridiculous numbers here, ridiculous numbers. <sighs> so I'm Jabra, I work for a company called Rapid7. I do a lot of pen testing, I write some Perl, I work with the Backtrack guys, we do you know, the remote exploit thing. Um, it's all good, so uh, yeah, that's me. Cool. So um, we decided to do a talk on de-anonymization. Uh, we've done uh, a lot of talks on you know, hacking browsers and uh, hacking websites, but we really wanted to kind of change it up a little bit and talk about hacking individuals. Um, so um, you know, quickly, why this all matters, uh, I mean, we all kind of care about our privacy at some level. You know, we don't want everyone to know about our secret things and you know, our passwords and that kind of thing. Uh, but people, I think, oftentimes think that they're very secure, especially in this industry. You know, you know I, I've done my due diligence. I'm using a proxy, and, and therefore I'm secure. Uh, so we decided to, to go after, you know, kind of our own uh, to kind of demonstrate that, we, that it, there are quite a few holes in um, kind of our mantra around our own privacy. So why is privacy good? Um, it's good because, you know, a lot of people want to drop docs on you, right? You know, you're a security guy. You don't really want your information all over the Internet. Uh, Say for, for for political dissidents, you know the the common uh, thing is you know the Chinese guy you know um, against the country you know this is uh, his country might want to kill him for some reason or put him in jail or whatever. Uh, say for for people uh, who might be you know, subject to violent crimes, you know they don't want to you know their jealous ex boyfriend to go come kill him or whatever. Uh, say for for people who have fetishes. Um, <laughs> for good or for bad. Uh, safer for whistleblowers as well. Uh, so I think there's a lot of different reasons why privacy is good, and we all kind of you know encourage ourselves to try to be private um, uh, if we're doing anything sensitive, um, and uh, ultimately increases freedoms. So, but there's a bunch of reasons it's also bad. Um, it's a uh, it's a safe and for havel, uh, for evil doers, and I'm not going to try to define what that is, but it's sort of it's up for interpretation. But it allows them to attack, um, you know, and kind of retreat and exfiltrate the data all uh, relatively quickly and uh, without ramifications, uh, and therefore it hurts law enforcement, whether you're pro or against. It's kind of irrelevant, um, and it prevents the social um, com you know compact that we all have one with one another. If you come up and say something bad to me and to my face, I can do something about it. But if you say it over the internet, it's a little bit harder. So uh, it's harder to enforce that over the internet uh, with privacy. But either way, privacy is broken. Um, and we're here to kind of demonstrate qu quite a few of those different things because it's, it's too complex. Um, ultimately, um, if you can find someone's IP address, I think that's kind of the gold standard. If you, if you know their real IP address, then you can go do something about it. That's sort of the, the big, uh, big thing that we want to find about each other. Um, not that that's particularly difficult. So, um, but what about we, if we can do stuff that's even better? So um, we found quite a, ways, a few ways to do that. So let's start with a basic de -anonymi um, uh, anonymization guide, uh, and then we'll break that. All right, so the first thing that you do when you're looking at being anonymous is you look at, okay, what can I do to mask you know, what I want to do on the internet? So can I use things um, like a proxy and then just traffic? Um, I'll just send all my traffic through this proxy. So something like Tor is really ideal because you'll have you know, all these proxies communicating and you're just sending your information into the proxy and then at the end it just goes out through this end node. So that's pretty cool. Um, you can also do things like you know, clearing your cookies, clearing your session, um, using no script, you know, really doing the things diligently to protect and mask your identity. Um, you can also use links so no one knows really what you are and where you're coming from, that sort of stuff. So yeah, the next component is using things like free email systems, right? So you can, you can set up like a Gmail server if you want to log in to you know, some new, new application. You have things like Lala or whatever. You can just create a free email account and then just log in with that bogus email. They won't be able to track you back to one, you know, one particular email which you use for all your data, like your corporate email. You just use this other account. So it's, it's a pretty good way to do it. And you're, you're basically, um, you're dividing up um, all your user accounts so that no one can actually track you back to, you know, your, your corporate account. Fair enough. Okay, so now the client side certificate stuff, right? So what I did was I looked at taking a client who's connecting back to a server and they're using like some sort of public key. So this information is stored within your browser and what happens if you're going and using this with Firefox is you browse to a website and you have your pu public key within your browser. So the, the browser says, okay, you want to send your public key. 
and there's just an OK button. And you click OK, and you think about it, and you're like, wait a minute, what, what sort of bad thing could have actually occurred? Um, I'm trans transmitting my public key to a server, and it has nothing to do with the server that I was actually supposed to be sending this information to. So it's like, well, that's kind of bad. Um, so we go on to the next slide. And so what, what information is actually stored within the public key? Well, there's a whole lot of information about your name, your email, the system that it's running on. So hypothetically, you can tie this back to, OK, I know it's running, in this example, Fedora Core 4 on you know, some you know, EDU or whatever. It's just like an example, right? But if you look at gathering information about the actual target, um, all you need to do is really grab this public key. So can you use something like TCP dump? Um, and you can put it, and you can just you know, sniff that traffic, grab the public key. Um, and I have a screenshot we can show later. It's just like using Wireshark to actually grab this public key. And then you can see the information just clear text right there with Wireshark. So it's kind of good to be able to actually gather this information. And then if we go to the next slide, what we'll see is, OK, so if you have this information about the client, so we have their email address or their name or some piece of information, a lot of companies will use a common email schema to actually determine how we're going to create this email address. So it's, it's really helpful as an attacker to be able to say, OK, so in traditional phishing, what I would do would be to grab a list of employees and just create my email list. Well, this is sort of the reverse of that. All I need to do is just grab the email address and then just reverse it back to a full name of the individual. So now I know their name. Um, you know, hypothetically, I know their handle. And now I can start trying to get into that server because based on the public key, I know when it expires. So all I need to do is just you know, sort of do a brute force attack. And you're, you're much more likely of actually grabbing a shell because you're, you're, you're doing it you know, with all the basis of this knowledge. That's sort of how it follows. So um, I think a lot of people here have heard of Tor. Yeah? Yeah, a few of you. A few of you heard of it. Uh, so um, it's a pretty common way to anonymize yourself. You just kind of bounce through a bunch of proxies. Um, there was uh, a couple of guys, uh, minimum a couple of guys, uh, who compromised some Tor exit nodes and were logging information as it, uh, as it went out of their network, uh, including um, 100 embassy passwords. And the reason why 100 is an interesting number is because it's exactly 100. It wasn't 105, it wasn't 96, it was exactly 100, which means that there's probably a lot of other information that they didn't give out. In fact, I know this a lot more. But there were such amazingly good passwords as temp and 123456 and Egypt with a I instead of a Y, very, very clever. Um, so Breach um, uh, actually has a uh, project where they have a bunch of different honeypots set up. Uh, so you know, bad guys will you know route their traffic through it, and they're kind of track tracking all this stuff and saying, okay, well here's what bad guy traffic looks like, and uh, sort of monitoring that that kind of information. Um, so ultimately, you know, you got to find a proxy that you trust, which is very difficult because it's not your machine. Remember, it's somebody else's machine, um, and uh, hopefully, it's not linked back to you, so you can't really have any prior knowledge of it, um, which makes that very difficult. So Jabro worked on some way to uh, create a hacked version of Tor uh, that would actually do all the same stuff that the same guy, the guys who did the uh, the Tor exit node hacking would be able, you know, basically make that whole process a lot easier for everybody. But uh, we just sort of ran out of time. So, uh, so this is uh, this little image tag here is a very quick way for you to de-anonymize or at least detect that someone is coming through a Tor node. Um, uh, because onion routing has its own protocol or its own uh, TLD rather, um, if you have a server set it, set up uh, inside the Tor no network, you can actually detect them coming through and pinging it, and it's your machine because you put it there. Or you can p use this piece of JavaScript to say yes, you are or aren't on Tor. Uh, so it's a very uh, if you're running JavaScript, um, it's a very easy way to detect that you're coming from JavaScript space. Uh, so yeah, like probably a year and a half or two years ago or something, I created this thing called Mr. T. It was based off of uh, Ronald's project, um, Black Dragon, I think it was called. Um, but basically, it's a way to enumerate a bunch of plugins, uh, history, screen resolution, a bunch of kind of the basic components uh, that give you information about your target and allow you to go after them. Uh, not great for de-anonymization, but great for you know potential for exploitation. You might be able to say, oh, well, if you've got this specific plugin, I know that you're going to be vulnerable to this particular thing, because uh, lots and lots of plugins have major uh, major issues with them. So I was looking at uh, utilizing this browser exploitation framework. You guys. You guys know about this browser exploitation framework? Yes, no? Yes? All right, cool. So it's a really awesome piece of software. And what it does is it says, OK, anyone who goes to a malicious website that I've actually modified with something like cross-site scripting or my website, I can attach it to this framework. And I can do a lot of cool things once you're attached to this framework. 
So what I can do um, is just basically detect what types of things are in the browser. I can detect all the plugins. I can detect, you know, what are you doing, all your cookies, all that sort of stuff. I can do keystroke logging, a bunch of cool stuff. So for this talk, what I did was I said, okay, it's really important to actually be able to improve the quality of this browser exploitation framework because what we really want to do is really, really just want to get a shell. But we're going to build upon all of this detection information to do that. So for this talk, what I did was I said, okay, what do we have for detecting you know, various types of operating systems? Okay, that's pretty good. Okay, what, what other things can we look at? So I said, okay, there's VMware, which there was a currently, there was a module in there that used ActiveX. So I said, okay, this is not as good as the ideal where I could use something that's is gonna work everywhere. Um, we'll write it in Java, it'll work pretty much anywhere. And then, you know, you can use it in Linux, you can use it in Windows, whatever, it doesn't matter. So that's what I did for this talk. Um, and you know, I've incorporated that in the new version of Beef, which should be out in a couple of weeks. Incidentally, a lot of this stuff we have demos for, uh, but we need to race through the slides to make sure we get to the end, then we'll, we'll show the demos. Yeah, all the demos are going to be online. Um, there's URLs at the end of the talk, so everyone's gonna, you know, everyone will be able to go and see the demos. Awesome. Um, next slide. Okay. So the cool thing is that cloud computing is where all the businesses are going. That's where everything's going. Everyone's you know, putting all their data in the cloud, right? So. To be able to detect if you're running within something like VMware or QEMU, uh, QEMU is a open source virtualization mechanism, or VirtualBox or Amazon EC2, all we really need to do is be able to get the user to run a piece of Java within their browser. So just a simple Java applet that would detect the MAC address and then do a simple regular expression check to say, okay, are you within this range? And you look at the first three octets and you say, okay, compare that and then just determine uh, what we're looking at. So that's, that's already incorporated, it's pretty good. And um, we can actually, for Amazon EC2, it's even better. We can say, okay, I know you're in this particular region. So like US East or Europe West, that's pretty nice. What else? So this pretty much it works everywhere again. Um, so IE, Firefox, Linux, Windows. Um, I had a couple of issues with Mac, but you know, talk to the Apple guys and they say, yeah, that stuff will work, so awesome. So what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to leverage this sort of information in our attacks. So we don't really have any attacks against uh, you know the virtualization mechanisms, but you know we're, we're all, <laughs> that stuff that stuff will come in time. So um, the next component that I looked at was actually taking this to the next level and actually getting shells based on you know this sort of information. So if we can detect that the user has Java within their browser, just like Java dot enabled and such, all we need to do is just create a self signed Java applet self-signed by something like the Microsoft Corporation and then just run the applet and we get a shell. That's pretty cool. And we'll just customize another one for Linux, the same thing for Mac, and you know, it's, it's pretty nice. So if they're running in Linux with sudo, cache root privs, great, now we get a root shell. Pretty nice. Um, and if we're, you know, if they don't have Java enabled, we'll just redirect them to browser autopone, which is the, uh, the Metasploit exploitation framework. The next component. So, in summary, I did a ton of work on Beef. We have Tor detection. We have the Java ping sweeper that R Snake wrote. And what it is, it's basically determining, um, based on some really cool AJAX, um, which you can talk about if you want, um, determining what are the internal IP addresses for this organization, for this person who went to my page. Um, we'll just do an internal ping sweep on their network to determine, okay, what else can we see? Um, Wouldn't it be able to be great to go to a web page and get a complete pen test? That's what we're going for. So the next component is just um, looking at increasing and, and just integrating all this stuff into Beef. So it's really just a full detection engine for your pen tests. And then getting all that information to be transmitted between modules is what we're going to work on next. Um, we also incorporated some of the cool stuff to be able to determine, okay, give me the Alexa top 500 of where this person has been. So now I know, okay, they've been to you know, Google, they've been to Twitter, all that stuff, cross that request forgery, all that stuff comes into play. So. so a new version coming out. 
So um, there's a bunch of different ways to get uh, internal IP address range or the IP address of the actual box you're on. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this stuff. Um, what, a really good one I thought was SCP. Um, WinSCP used to have a vulnerability where you could actually get people to upload files to you, which was interesting. Uh, Word PDF bugs, you'll find this stuff on decloak.net. Um, interestingly, I went through the about config just kind of hoping I could short circuit a lot of this research and just kind of jump right to the protocol handlers and, and look at them. Uh, it turns out that um, most protocol handlers that are really interesting don't actually reside in about config, at least not for protocol handler. You'd think it would, but it doesn't. Uh, including ITMS. <clears throat> ITMS is what iTunes uses to communicate. Um, in fact, I've uh, talked a lot with Apple over the last uh, couple weeks. Uh, and Firefox and uh, the IE guys um, all about this issue. Uh, because who owns this bug? So you come to my webpage, um, I spawn uh, ITMS protocol. Uh, with, there's a bug in ITMS that allows me to make it visit any page. But forget that for a second, just assume that it worked that way naturally. Um, so I get you to visit my page, uh, but instead of going through the proxy that you set up, you're instead following the proxy settings of Firefox, which are different than that of the base operating system. It doesn't matter what operating system we're talking about, but you know, let's say it's Windows. Um, and then you connect directly to me, so now I've got your real IP address as well as the proxy IP address as long as I s submit some sort of payload in the DNS request. So, uh, and this is already on decloak.net. It's been there for a couple months. I, I just did never post it about it, but if you go check it out, it's already there. Um, so we, we spent a lot of time talking with the guys, like, whose bug is this? Where does it belong? Um, I don't think we ever came to a real conclusion, but I'm more and more thinking that it actually is Firefox's bug, except that if they ever fix it, it'll make a lot of people's lives a lot worse because they won't be able to have a proxy inside, inside uh, uh, Firefox as well as using everything else. So the conclusion to that is if you want to be anonymous and you're using Firefox, you, ha you have to use something like Tor Button. Not Tor Browser, Tor Button. They're very different. One is totally insecure and the other one is very good. So uh, just FYI. So um, uh, David Byrne came up something uh, probably a year and a half ago or so um, called res timing. Uh, so he could basically check how fast um, you, something was uh, coming up by instantiating it like a thousand times. So if you instantiate it a thousand times and it's not there, it's a different time than if it is there, uh, which is great. You can enumerate anything on the file system, but it just takes a long time. So uh, not particularly useful in, as it stands by itself. I made it less useful uh, by porting it to a non-JavaScript version. Uh, but, uh, you know, hey, now you don't have to have JavaScript turned on. Um, so then I came up with something called SMB enum. Um, and uh, I didn't publish it, but um, here I, I'll tell you all about it right now. Um, so I told Rich Mogul about this. You know, I'm able to enumerate uh, your hard drive uh, when you visit my website. And here you go. And I gave him a link. And it was, uh, it was telling what he had installed. And he's like, what the fuck? Uh, and that's right. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of like you don't expect that to happen. That is definitely a cross-zone boundary uh, thing that's uh, vulnerable in IE in multiple ways, both with res timing and SMB. Also uh, included in beef. Also included in beef, sorry. And, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, but um, usernames and computer names uh, are really what we're after. You know, we don't, IP address is great, but what if I can get your, you? I want to know who you are. Uh, maybe there's like 20 users on that box. I want to know who you are. Um, but more importantly, it's easier to track you down. If your name's Bob Smith, it's a little harder, but, uh, but you know what I mean. It's, uh, you know, how many, you know, Robert Hansons are there in the security world? Like two or three, you know, it makes it a lot easier. Um, so one example in IE, if you can get someone to cut and paste this URL, it'll actually drop uh, the username and the full path um, of where, where their uh, user directory is, or computer name and full path of, the, of where their user directory is. Um, you know, I obfuscated a little bit, uppercase, lowercase kind of thing. Um, so basically you send them a broken link in an email. You say, hey, can you please you know, click on this or whatever. They can't click on it because it's a broken link, but they'll cut and paste it into IE and boom, you got all that information. Works pretty well. Uh, SMB, uh, again, a different way to do SMB. Inside of an iframe, you have something as simple as file colon slash 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 and then slash slash uh, and then some IP address, which is the location of uh, where your SMB si server is sitting on the other side as long as you got Windows networking working. Um, I was told that um, about 50% of networks don't have the ability to have outbound SMB through, you know, outside the, uh, the corporate firewall, whatever. But 50% is still pretty good, which means I can actually get all of your information. And when I do mean all, I mean all. Computer name, um, your name, uh, what service pack you have, all kinds of crazy stuff. So as long as you got something sitting there watching the wire, uh, you can actually get all kinds of crazy information uh, from that payload. So SMB enum um, is great, but it's and it's pretty fast. I mean, you can you can probably enumerate it 
I don't know, probably several hundred things in a second, uh, or a couple seconds. Uh, it's pretty fast. Um, so how it works is it basically does a file colon slash 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 uh, for the local drive um, and tries to pick out files. So in JavaScript space, you're only allowed to pull out certain things like images, CSS, JavaScript. I'm not allowed to pull you know, .exes or .log or anything else that would be very interesting. I just can't do it. But with this information, I can actually narrow down what you do have. And then combining this with res colon, now I can actually pull out this very specific granular thing you've got and not just kind of the big picture of what your drive looks like. So you use SMB first, res timing for the granularity, and then you start owning them based off what you actually know. Uh, this is pretty good at um, being, it's pretty accurate with the exception of once you've uninstalled something, a lot of times in the uninstall process, it leaves images in place. Uh, but other than that, it, it is pretty accurate. Uh, I talked to the IE guys about it. They know about it. I don't know if there's a patch forthcoming. I think it would be kind of difficult to fix. Uh, this is an unauth unauthenticated state, but it doesn't matter because you're local to the drive. Uh, so the other thing that we tried to do, and I actually threw away the code. I built it, and then I threw it away. Uh, I was you know, so frustrated. I'm like, ah, I hate this. Um, but I was able to do username detection the pro and uh, actually enumerate usernames. The problem is uh, the key space for usernames is absolutely gin ginormous. And if I have to go through and pull images for every single, every single one of these different uh, things. So, so let's, let's take one of these for example. If I had Flash and Flash had um, an image that was based inside my user directory, I could look for, you know, okay, and I know you have Flash, but now I got to look for your user directory so you can actually use them in common to figure out where usernames, usernames are on the drive. Uh, the problem with that is that it takes a very long time to enumerate. Um, in fact, uh, I never got it to work unless it was only like 20 usernames. So if you know it's one of 20 things, it's pretty fast. But if you know it's one of 20,000 things, uh, the user will be sitting there for a very long time. Might even crash their computer. So, um, so all that stuff's great. Uh, it's fantastic, except for it all relies that I have a trap. So I have to like convince you to do something, or I have to sort of know that you are, like want to come and attack me, and I have to kind of lay this trap out, which is, I mean, that's fantastic and everything, but it's not all that practical in a lot of cases. Or I have to, you know, do some of the Jabra stuff and actually automatically own every single one of my users, and then you know go back and say, okay, who were there all those users that I compromised? You know, it's sort of like it's it's too much of a wide you know range. Too, it's like a thermonuclear weapon when I just want to take out one person. Uh, so um, I was thinking about other ways you could kind of go backwards in time and, and try to do stuff or, or like have such a, a, such a passive look, uh, listening device that you'd be able to kind of grab all this information. So first thing I was thinking is malware, right? It's the obvious thing. If you can get malware on people's boxes, it would be great. But again, noisy and you'd have to do it to everybody and uh, not, not uh, you know, kind of OS specific, that kind of stuff. Uh, second is stuff like, um, and uh, spyware, you know, like... Uh, um, yeah, come on, give me some spyware. You know what I'm talking about. Um, like Alexa or something. Uh, this phoning home all the time, saying where you are, trying to give information out. But that relies you on you being Alexa or having all your users have Alexa. And it's just not that common of a, of a plugin or toolbar or whatever. So uh, what about Google? What about uh, safe browsing? So, um, so I went back and I started really thinking about it. And, um, and it turns out that there's some things that are going on in the hood of safe browsing. So safe browsing is designed to protect you. So let's say you go to a, a phishing site or a malware site. Uh, the browser will kind of pop up an alert and say you're not supposed to go there, you're, you're going to get compromised or whatever. So it's great for consumers. Uh, it's actually great for security, except for the fact that it's phoning home all the time. Uh, so I left it running for a day, um, and I got somewhere in the neighborhood, if you, if you average it all out, to around 30 requests per hour out to Google, which is quite a bit. Um, so it does, it's not like perfect. Sometimes it's a little bit more, sometimes it's a little less. It goes in bursts. Sometimes it's like 15 at once, and then 12, and then 18, you know. So it's kind of, it's not all very consistent. Uh, and I talked to the Mozilla guys about that, and they said, well, you know, it really shouldn't be honing, phoning home that much. There might have been a bug there, and there could easily be. So that was just my test. You feel free to test yourself. But the important part here is that it's phoning home and actually setting a cookie. So we all know cookies can be used for tracking. You know, um, it, this might be actually a unique identifier. It might be um, a hash, um, an algorithm that they use to uh, say when we deliver um, this encrypted payload, you can decrypt it with the key that you just sent us, that kind of thing. So public-private key sort of thing. Uh, but that's irrelevant. I actually don't care what that key consists of. All I care about is that it's unique. Uh, you can clear your cookies all the time, and people are pretty good about that. Let's say you wake up in the morning and you're going to go hack somebody. So you log in, you turn on your browser, you go get a cup of coffee. It's phoning home, setting cookies, right? Uh, and then you turn on your proxy, and you decide you're going to go hack somebody. 
Well, so the nice thing about this is that it actually does follow the proxy. Normally you want to go outside the proxy and you want to try to identify who someone is directly. But in this case it follows the proxy. It's very polite and does exactly what it's supposed to do. Uh, the problem with that is that let's say I'm on the other side and I'm China and I want to, you know, I want to kill that dissident or whatever. Um, you know, it's, it's great to be able to say, okay, well, you know, I know I'm getting hacked from this proxy. Um, you know, maybe someone else has some information about it. Maybe I can go try to break in that proxy, but maybe it's outside the country. Maybe there's all things, other things that get in the way, or maybe they RM minus RF on the way out or whatever. But it's been phoning home the whole time. So I can go to Google and I can say, hey, Google, can you give me the IP address and all associated IP addresses with this cookie over this timestamp? So this cookie came in, this timestamp, tell me everything else outside of that. Um, and as a result, they can actually get everything that's correlated to that. So they can get your uh, home you know, IP address, they can get the Starbucks down the street, they can get whatever, right? It just depends on wherever you've connected from. And it doesn't matter if you clear cookies on the, as you're booting up or as long, you know, you have to do it as well as when you're shutting down. So you clean your cookies before you start because you don't want to leak information out that might be going to that, the, hack cl the client that you want to hack or whatever. Um, so you want to tear down your session after it's over, but now you still set that cookie. It was still phoning home that whole time. It set a new cookie. And now you're using the new cookie when you tear down your session and you're using it from your own personal IP address. So it really doesn't matter whether you turn it off um, in one place or the other. You have to do it in both places. You have to be consistent. You have to always do it. Um, and so not that many people clean their cookies that religiously where they're going to never get caught by that. The dangerous part about this is now you're thinking, well, I'm going to go and turn that off. Well, it doesn't matter. This is all backwards in time. So this is all in the logs. So if you've ever done anything ever illegal when you're using Firefox or Chrome, uh, for the last probably year and a half or so, um, actually maybe even longer than that, um, they have the potential of having that logs. So now whether they do have the logs or not is in question. Uh, they say that they keep all logs for two weeks. Um, then after that they keep in aggregate. So there's two ways to keep things in aggregate. You can keep like global statistics, like the amount of people who visit uh, the site or something, that's an that's a aggregate. Another aggregate is IP address, um, cookie, and uh, timestamps. That is easily enough information in aggregate to de-anonymize anyone who uses your browser. Um, so um, they also say we're not going to give, um, let's see, they say, uh, there's their terms of service, you know, we have good faith belief that access, use, pre preservation, or disclosure of such information is reasonably necessary to satisfy any applicable law, so any legal entity that comes down says we want this information, theoretically has it, regulation, legal process, or enforceable government request, government request, uh, enforce applicable terms of service including investigation of potential violations thereof, detect prevalent or otherwise address fraud, security or technical issues, or protect against harm to the rights, property, or safety of Google, its users, or the public. So uh, basically they pretty much have carte blanche. Now let's say that they were totally benign and they had no intentions of ever using this ever for anything bad. It kind of doesn't matter. Um, so let's say um, the FBI comes down within that first two week period and let's say they are getting rid of everything, let's say they're, they're really trying to do a good job. Uh, the FBI can still come down and say you need to hold on to this information for an additional, uh, I think it's like 60 days or something. Can anyone fact check me on that? 60? No one knows that? Wow. <laughs> it's bad. Uh, so I think they can keep it for like 60 days or something after that fact and say well I don't have the subpoena or warrant. Or, what's that? 90 days, all right. Um, and, and then they can force you to hold it indefinitely after that if they do have, um, if they do have the subpoena or, or whatever. Uh, so it, it, and they also say we don't correlate this to your username. Well, again, they don't do that, but that is irrelevant. The government can still force them to do that correlation on their behalf. Uh, so it, it almost just doesn't matter what their intentions are in this. Uh, it, it still can be used. So um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I was sort of in my head thinking you were all going to be very close and could read what's on the screen, but basically this is just the transmission of the cookie back and forth and, uh, and the shavar and, and, uh, and some of the payloads going back and forth. But uh, this information will be posted online if you want to take a look at it or just open up a proxy and, and just watch the information go by. It's pretty simple. Chrome, however, has an interesting uh, thing. So the hypothesis that they're doing totally all, this is all benign and they're not meaning to track anybody and that stuff kind of goes out the window when you're talking about Chrome. Chrome has an additional two pieces that are going across the wire when it does updates. Updates don't happen 30 times an hour. They happen once every five hours, so significantly less amount of time. But they do send two additional pieces of information which I think are pretty interesting. Machine ID and user ID. So why do you know to, need to know my user ID to give me an update? Right? 
uh, I, it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I can figure out, I, you know, maybe it's plausible, to, to, it's important to know what my machine information is so you can track it and know, hey, maybe we should have more updates for uh, Windows th you know, server, blah, 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 this very specific variant. But user ID, you know, uh, so I, I think it's a little unusual to pass that information out to the web. That's certainly a huge privacy concern um, and certainly can be tracked back to your user um, over time uh, because that information doesn't change. So with that, I think we should just get to the demos. All right. So, so this first one is being able to identify all the different websites that the user has been to. So all they're doing is they're collect connecting to Beef and we just detect all that information. So this is the new version of Beef and it's just the, uh, the visited URL. So as you'll see here, we have the Alexa Top 500 and all we need to do is just click send and then you get the information. Now the new version of Beef is really awesome because it has this new improved logging functionality. So the older versions didn't really have this and now all the information is just right there. And all you get is the information, these are the pages they've been to. You don't get any junk where you know, they've been to, you know, they haven't been to this website, they just get the good stuff. So that was using the CSS history hack that you're all probably familiar with. Um, using the view, you know, if the color of a, a link is changed based off of whether you've been there or not, you can detect that in JavaScript space. Um, you don't have to use JavaScript, but Beef uh, heavily uses JavaScript. Okay. So this one is just detecting the plugins within the browser. So as you can see, you have like tons of information about all their plugins. So if they have a, a vulnerable plugin, all we need to do is just go and go about it actually exploiting it. So you guys can see how we're going with this, right? You're getting information about the client. Uh, you're going after them uh, based on that specific piece of information instead of just dumping a bunch of stuff, which is going to cause a lot of pop-ups. The problem with hacking browsers is there's a lot of warnings uh, through every single one of those steps. Uh, so the more you can sort of reduce that, the more uh, likely it is that you're going to get uh, a shell on the box or you know compromise your network or whatever you're trying to do without causing that uh, that user to be aware of that happening. And that's what we're all about. We're all about getting shells. So let's do that. So this is the virtualization detection mechanism. Um, the older version had the detection of VMware, but this actual version actually detects QEMU, VirtualBox, Amazon EC2. So this demonstration is just Amazon, or this is actually uh, VMware. And this will be released in the next couple of weeks. This is interesting for a couple different reasons. Um, a lot of security dudes happen to use some sort of virtualization. So uh, if you don't want to pop your shell inside of a security guy's window, it's kind of nice to know that you're inside of a VM. Um, it could also be interesting to know where geographically they are or uh, maybe they're using, it's a virtual host but it's a bad one or maybe uh, the network isn't well secured so once you're on a virtual box it's essentially shared hosting and you can start attacking the network, all kinds of stuff. Okay, so the next one is using browser autopone. So I couldn't actually get the newest version of browser autopone to work because I didn't have a VMware system to actually exploit. So I just used Netcat on Backtrack 4. So it's pretty good. It's all we're going to do is we're just going to inject a, an iframe and just redirect them to this page. So what we'll see here is just modifying the configuration information. I've already, I've already included the RC file, as you guys will see up, on, up there. But this is just redirecting them to a Netcat session just listening. So obviously if you're going to do browser exploitation, all you would do would just be, you know, have your Metasploit system listening and then just send your exploits. So there we can see the client connected, they sent their information to Netcat game over. Now the Java applet. This one's really, really cool. And what we would do if we actually had a client on Linux or Mac, we would just detect actually what operating system they're running and then present them with the corresponding VMware or Java applet in this case to actually exploit their system. Just get a shell, do something a little bit different. Um, this particular actual exploitation is downloading an EXE you know, MSF payload, and then just, you know, run it. 
and this is self signed by the Microsoft Corporation. Obviously, for Apple, you would just do Apple and must be secure. Yeah, must be. So I just called it update Microsoft Corporation. Switch over to Linux box, zoom in, and there's our shell. Do you all catch that? Like, you can compromise people by going to a web page. Single click, <laughs> one click, Pretty easy. I get a shell. Done. <laughs> Come on. There's no patch for this. There's no patch for this. This works as by design. Um, Does that violate Amazon's one quick patch? <laughs> Okay, now uh, the SMB enum stuff. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I can actually see you guys now. I'm supposed to picture you naked. That's a All ugly right, SMB side. enum. <laughs> I think I'm good on picturing them naked. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. I was gonna say. I'm, I'm good. No. So bingo, we got, we got all the software that's installed in this box. So this is a, I put this list together in like literally 20 minutes or something. Uh, so that could be greatly, greatly improved. Um, it's just a matter of time, how much time you really want to spend uh, making it go through and making all those SMB requests. It's local, so it's pretty damn fast. Uh, you could probably do it up to maybe 1,000 or 2,000 within just a few seconds. But beyond that, you probably want to find some other way to enumerate. Patch is accepted. <laughs> yeah, come on, exactly. guys. So this demo is actually disabling safe browsing. So you know you can send this to your mom or your dad, just disable safe browsing. Okay, let's give them a quick how-to. <laughs> and uh, full screen sign, there we go. So this is one way to do it. You can also do it through tools, security, and then click the two buttons. But if about config is your, is your sweet spot, you can also do it there. Of, of course, you know, um, the Mozilla guys were in the audience when we did this at Black Hat, and, uh, and they said, well, you know, we really don't recommend that people uh, turn safe browsing and, you know, safe, you know, safe browsing off. Um, all right, I'm sure you all appreciate bright lights <laughs> after a hangover. Uh, all right, but anyway, um, you know, we talked to them, and they're like, yeah, we, we, uh, we really appreciate uh, people to keep it on. You know, it's, it's better, for their pri better for their security and all that stuff, and, and that's true, uh, but it's just a matter of understanding the trade-offs. If you happen to be a security guy and don't happen to be vulnerable to a lot of that stuff or happen to know that your target isn't going to try to exploit you back, um, then it probably is a good idea that you turn it off. So yeah, that's pretty much all the demos. Um, I, had, I had one more component, um, the client-side stuff. This is just an example of sniffing a client-side certificate. So as you can see, you'd get like common name and all this information about your organization or whatever. Um, and that's just, in, you know, just using Wireshark on you know, public certificate. So this is just a quick example of how to set it up. I'll put this stuff on my blog and you, know, you guys can take a look pretty easy all I did was I just used open SSL and created my own certificate and then I just had it listen and correspondingly accept client-side certs pretty easy to so do. more and more banks are starting to use client-side certs not so much in the United States but um, definitely a lot more internationally um, a few banks here have started doing it as well uh, trading platforms that kind of stuff uh, it's, it's kind of more common like for smaller companies who want to protect themselves without kind of a lot of the hassles of a lot like tokens you know, like actual hardware tokens that kind of stuff so um, we, um, uh, we actually uh, are going to be in room 106 for Q&A if you guys uh, have any questions. Um, but uh, I appreciate you all coming out. Hold um, on. Let's, let's just show them where they can get like, the, the, the slides and such. OK. So he's going to put the slides up if you want to write it down. Um, otherwise, just meet us in uh, room 106. They're right here. All the slides are going to be here. And thank you very much, guys. Thank you.